the National Sunday Law, Part 3. We will begin at page 89. Senator Blair, was the Inquisition abolished by the abolition of the Sunday Laws? Mr. Jones, no, but the principle of it was established by Sunday Laws. Then, if the Inquisition was established by the Sunday Laws, how was it abolished by the abolition of the Sabbath? How can you remove an effect except by removing its cause? Mr. Jones, the Sunday laws never have been abolished. Senator Blair, then the Sunday law could not have been the cause of the Inquisition. Mr. Jones, the power which embodies the Inquisition still continues and its emissaries have been in this country defending the Inquisition. That same power is now grasping for the control of the civil law, and the same causes generally produce the same effects, Senator Blair, and the removal of the causes removes the effects with them. Mr. Jones, sometimes, Senator Blair, therefore the Sunday laws were not the cause of the Inquisition unless the Inquisition still exists. Mr. Jones, no, the Sunday law did not cause the Inquisition, Senator Blair. I understood you to say that it did. Mr. Jones, I say through that the Church received the power to make the principle and the work of the Inquisition effective. A certain exercise of power may be forbidden, and yet the means by which the power was obtained may not be forbidden. In other words, the power which was obtained through the deception of Sunday laws may be prohibited in certain things and yet allowed in many other things. Senator Blair the Lord made the Sabbath and governed the Jewish nation for nearly 3,000 years with a Sabbath. Do you think the Sabbath was for the good of the Jewish people or for their injury? Mr. Jones, it was established for the good of the human race. Senator Blair, including the Jewish people? Mr. Jones, yes, sir. Senator Blair, it was established as a part of civil administration. Mr. Jones, but the church and the state were one. Senator Blair, therefore what we call the civil administration was included in that theocracy. Mr. Jones, the church and the state were one. They were united and it was a theocracy. Senator Blair, if the administration of the Sabbath during these 3,000 years at least was for the good of the Jews and the human race, why will not the Sabbath be good for the Jews and the human race since the time of Christ as well as before? Mr. Jones, it is for the good of the human race. Senator Blair, the civil law must administrate it if it, is, if it is done. Then we will get no Sabbath now under our division of powers of government unless we have the Sabbath recognized and enforced by the state authority. Mr. Jones, certainly we have a Sabbath. Senator Blair, your proposition is to strike out the Sabbath from the constitution and condition of society in these modern times? Mr. Jones, no, sir. Senator Blair, certainly so far as its existence and enactment and enforcement by law are concerned. Mr. Jones, yes, by civil law. Senator Blair, it was enforced in what we call the civil conduct of men under the theocratic form of government for at least 3,000 years. Mr. Jones, certainly. Senator Blair, now the observance of the Sabbath depends upon a compulsory observance of the law. Mr. Jones, not at all. Senator Blair, it required the law of God which he enforced by death by stoning men to death when they violated it, and we have the Sabbath day only by virtue of what we call the civil law, which is equally a part of God's law. Mr. Jones, that government was not organized specially to enforce the Sabbath. Senator Blair, they stoned men to death who violated the law. Mr. Jones, certainly, and likewise for the transgression of the other commandments. Senator Blair, God enforced it, in other words, by human means. Mr. Jones, certainly, my answer to all that is that that was a theocracy. A union of church and state. The church was the state and the state was the church. Senator Blair, you say now that there is no state to enforce it. Mr. Jones, I say that no government can enforce the Sabbath or those things which pertain to God except a theocratic government, a union of church and state. Therefore, I say that if you establish such a law as is here proposed, you lead directly to a union of church and state. 
The logic of the question demands it, and that is where it will end, because the law cannot be enforced otherwise. These gentlemen say they do not want a union of church and state. What they mean by church and state is for the state to select one particular denomination and make it the favorite above all other denominations. That is a union of church and state according to their idea, but a union of church and state was formed by Constantine when he recognized Christianity as the religion of the Roman Empire. Everybody knows that was what a union of church and state and that it ended in the papacy. A union of church and state is where the ecclesiastical power controls the civil power and uses the civil power in its own interest. That is where this movement will end, and that is one of the reasons why we oppose it. Senator Blair, you say the church and state separated shall not do those proper things which the church and state always did when united in the theocracy? No, sir, Mr. Jones. Senator Blair, then why do you say that the, that the state, Mr. Jones, I did not mean to deny your proposition. I think the way you intended, I mean, yes, because I certainly do say that the church and state separated shall do those proper things which were done when they were united in the theocracy. Senator Blair, if in this division of the powers of government into church and state, you exclude from the powers of the church the establishment and enforcement and regulation of the Sabbath. Why do you not necessarily, if the Sabbath is a good thing, pass it over to the control of the state? Mr. Jones, because if the church will not recognize it and preserve it, the state cannot compel people to do it. The state that attempts it is bound, is bound to fail. Senator Blair, then you necessarily take the ground that God did wrong in the enforcement of the Sabbath during those 3,000 years when his government was both church and state. Mr. Jones, no, sir. If God would come himself to govern and make himself governor as he did of Israel, he could enforce the law as he did there. But until God does that, we deny the right of all the churches or anybody else to do it. Senator Blair, even if it is for the good of society, Mr. Jones, what they say is for the good of society is for the ruin of society. Senator Blair, do you understand what it is, the church or the state that is making this law? Mr. Jones, it is the state that is doing it just as Constantine did it to satisfy the churches. Senator Blair, it may or may not satisfy the churches. The churches give their reasons here, which may be right or wrong for the establishment of the Sabbath, for the Sunday legislation in all the states. The state, the whole people, make the law. You say that the whole people shall not make a good law because the churches ask for it, Mr. Jones. I say the whole people shall not make a bad law, even though the churches do demand it. For any civil law relating to God is a bad law. Senator Blair, then what God did for 3,000 years for the good of the Jews and the human race was wrong? Mr. Jones, no, sir, it was right. Senator Blair, then why not continue it, Mr. Jones, because he has discontinued that kind of government? Senator Blair, we have done nothing in the world to divide the powers of government into those of church and state. We say those departments shall not interfere with each other. Mr. Jones, certainly. Senator Blair, here and in the states, we are trying to run the civil parts. We have taken jurisdiction of a portion of what God has entire jurisdiction as to the church and state in the civil relations of men. The entire society does that. We put the sovereignty into the hands of everybody except women, and some of us are trying to do that. We have the same subject matter, the good of society, under our control, which, under the theocracy, was united into both church and state. If we do not let the state continue to do what was essential to society, then and is now you are striking at one of the great ends for which government exists. Mr. Jones, not at all, because God has discontinued that kind of government. Senator Blair, he has not discontinued the necessity of laws for the regulation of society. Mr. Jones, he has in that way. Senator Blair, no, it is just as necessary that there should be a Sabbath now for the good of man as when God made and enforced the law by his direct supervision under a theocracy. Mr. Jones, but no government but a theocracy can enforce such laws. Senator Blair, 
then unless we have a theocracy, we shall have no Sabbath. Mr. Jones, we shall have no laws regulating the Sabbath. Sand or Blair, the Sabbath did not descend to the Jews and to all mankind because there was a theocracy theocratic form of government among the Jews. How did the Sabbath come to mankind at large when there was no theocratic form of government? Mr. Jones, those nations never kept it. Nobody but the Jews ever kept it. Sand or Blair, they could have kept it because you say the Sabbath existed for all, not for the Jews alone, but for the human race. Mr. Jones, certainly, but if they did not keep it, it would do no good. Sand or Blair, it did not exist for good then. Mr. Jones, certainly, a thing may exist for my good, and I may refuse to use it, as thousands do, the salvation of Christ. Sand or Blair, I was taking your statement as true, that it did exist for good outside of the Jews. Mr. Jones, I said it was for the good of man. The Savior said it was for the good of man. The Savior died for the good of man. Sand or Blair, you would abolish the Sabbath anyway? Mr. Jones, yes, in the civil law. Senator Blair, you would abolish any Sabbath from human practice, from which shall be in the form of law, unless the individual here and there sees fit to observe it. Mr. Jones, certainly, that is a matter between man and his God. Senator Blair, your time has expired. Please take five minutes to close, as I have asked you some questions. Still, they were questions that touched the tro that that touched the trouble in my own mind. Mr. Jones, certainly, but I suppose that I was to have an hour to devote uninterruptedly to the points in question. Senator Blair, we have always been accustomed to conducting these hearings with reference to getting at the difficulties we had in our own minds, and I do not feel as though you could complain with an hour and ten minutes if we give you ten minutes more. Mr. Jones, very good. Mr. Cha Chairman, I have shown that in the 4th century, this same movement developed a theocracy, and in that the papacy, religious despotism, and oppression for conscience sake. Now I want to show the secret of at least a portion of the present movement. The representative of the National Reform Association spoke here in behalf of this proposed legislation. That association is asking for such a law and for such an amendment to the Constitution as you have proposed in relation to the Christian religion in public schools that measure pleases them well and this proposed Sunday law pleases them well. Senator Blair, just incorporate that proposed amendment to the Constitution in your remarks. Mr. Jones, very well. It is as follows. 50th Congress, First Session, SR 86. Joint Resolution Proposing an Amendment to the Constitution of the United States Respecting Establishments of Religion and Free Public Schools. Resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled two-thirds of each House concurring therein that the following amendment to the Constitution of the United States be and hereby is proposed to the states to become valid when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the states as provided in the Constitution. Article Section 1. No state shall ever make or maintain any law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Section 2. Each state in this union shall establish and maintain a system of free public schools adequate for the education of all the children living therein between the ages of 6 and 16 years, inclusive in the common branches of knowledge and in virtue, morality, and the principles of the Christian religion. But no money raised by taxation is imposed, imposed by law, or any money or other property or credit belonging to any municipal organization or to any state or to the United States shall ever be appropriated, applied, or given to the use or purposes of any school, institution, corporation, or person whereby instructing or training shall be given in the doctrines, tenets, beliefs, ceremonials, or observances peculiar to any sect denomination organization or society being or claiming to be religious in its character nor shall such peculiar doctrines tenets beliefs ceremonials or observances be taught or inculcated in the free public schools section three 
to the end that each state, the United States and all the people thereof, may have and preserve governments republican in form and in substance, the United States shall guarantee to every state and to the people of every state and of the United States the support and maintenance of such a system of free public schools as is herein provided section four that congress shall enforce this article by legislation when necessary what then do these men propose to do with the civil power when they can use it the christian statesman is the organ of the, that association and in its issue of october two eighteen eighty four said give all men to understand that this is a christian nation and that believing that without christianity we perish we must maintain by all means our Christian character, inscribe this character in our constitution, enforce upon all who come among us the laws of Christian morality. To enforce upon men the laws of Christian morality is nothing else than an attempt to compel them to be Christians, and thus, in fact, compel them to be hypocrites. It will be seen at once that this will be, but to invade the rights of conscience and this one of the vice presidents of the association declares civil power has right to do rev david gregg d d now pastor of park street church boston a vice president of the national reform association plainly declared in the christian statesman of june fifth eighteen eighty four that the civil power has the right to command the consciences of men rev m a galt a district secretary and a leading worker of the association says our remedy for all these malefic influences is to have the government simply set up the moral law and recognize god's authority behind it and lay its hand on any religion that does not conform to it when they have the government lay its hand on dissenters what will they have it do rev e b graham also a vice president of the association in an address delivered at york nebraska and reported in the christian statesman of may twenty one eighteen eighty five said we might add in all justice if the opponents of the bible do not like our government and its christian features let them go to some wild desolate land and in the name of the devil and for the sake of the devil subdue it and set up a government of their own on infidel and atheistic ideas and then if they can stand it stay there till they die that is what they propose to do and that is worse than russia in the century for april eighteen eighty eight Mr. Kennan gave a view of the statutes of Russia on the subject of crimes against the faith, quoting statute after statute providing that whoever shall censure the Christian faith or the Orthodox Church or the Scriptures or the Holy Sacraments or the saints or their images or the Virgin Mary or the angels or Christ or God shall be deprived of all civil rights and exiled for life to the most remote, remote parts of Siberia. This is the system in Russia, and it is in the direct line of the wishes of the National Reform Association. Nor is that at all. Rev. Jonathan Edwards, D.D., another vice president of that association, makes all dissenters atheists. He names atheists, deists, Jews, and Seventh-day Baptists, then classes them all together as atheists. I will read his own words. These all are for the occasion and for so far as our amendment is concerned one class they use the same arguments and the same tactics against us they must be counted together which we very much regret but which we cannot help the first named is the leader in the discontent and in the outcry the atheist to whom nothing is higher or more sacred than man and nothing survives the tomb it is his class it labors its labors are almost wholly in his interest its success would be almost wholly his triumph the rest are adjuncts to him in this contest they must be named from him they must be treated as for this question one party they class us as atheists and are going to condemn us alike and you are and you are asked to give them the power Remember, these are the views of the members of the National Reform Association whose secretary stood at this table this morning in defense of this Sunday law. These extracts show that his ideas are and what his ideas are and how he would use them. Dr. Everts of Chicago, 
who also was here, declared last month in Chicago in my hearing on the subject of this Sunday law that it is atheism or the Sabbath. Mr. Edwards continues, What are the rights of the atheist? I would tolerate him as I would tolerate a poor lunatic, for in my view his mind is scarcely sound. So long as he does not rave, so long as he is not dangerous, I would tolerate him. I would tolerate him as I would a conspirator. The atheist is a dangerous man. Yes, to this extent, I will tolerate the atheist, but no more. Why should I? The atheist does not tolerate me. He does not smile either in pity or in scorn upon my faith. He hates my faith, and he hates me for my faith. I can tolerate difference and discussion. I can tolerate heresy and false religion. I can debate the use of the Bible in our common schools, the taxation of church property, the propriety of chaplaincies, and the like. But there are some questions past debate. Tolerate atheism, sir. There is nothing out of hell that I would not tolerate as soon. The atheist may live, as I have said, but God helping us, the taint of his destructive creed shall not defile any of the civil institutions of all this fair land. Let us repeat, atheism and Christianity are, con are contradict. Let us repeat, atheism and Christianity are contradictory terms. They are incompatible systems. They cannot dwell together on the same continent. Senator Blair. Many atheists are for Sunday laws, Mr. Jones. Let them be so if they choose. But what I am striking at is that these men have no right to say that I am an atheist simply because I do not believe in keeping Sunday. Senator Blair, you come here and seriously argue against these people because they and the atheists blackguard each other. What have we to do with that? They abuse each other. It is worse in the Christian than in the atheist, because the Christian has some rules to guide his conduct, which the atheist has not. Here seems to be some strong intemperate language which one human being makes use of towards another. An atheist or a Christian alike may find fault with that. I do not know any way that we can interfere with it, but if you claim to argue against this bill, because these people abused atheists, I reply to that by saying that many atheists are for this bill, just as these people are. They unite in support of this bill, therefore mutual recriminations amount to nothing. Mr. Jones, but the mutual recrimination amounts to this, that although this is confined simply to words between them now, Senator Blair, I do not think you ought to argue to us by taking this precious time of yours and ours to show that these people used intemperate language toward each other, Mr. J Mr. Jones, but I am doing it to show that they use the intemperate language now, but if they get the law, they will use more than the, the language against them. These men only want to make the state a party to their religious disputes. They want to get the nation by law to commit itself to the defense of religious observances so they can add its power to their side of the controversy and send to hell or some other place where the devil is, those who even accidentally disagree with them. But the state has no business to allow itself to be made a party to any religious controversy. That has been the bane of every nation except this, and God forbid that this one should be dragged from its high estate and made the tool of the irregular passions of religious parties. The state will find its legitimate employment in seeing that these parties keep their hands off each other and that the ebullitions of their religious zeal are kept within the bounds of civility. It is not safe to put civil power into the hands of such men as these, but that is just what the Sunday bill will will do, if it shall pass. Sandor Blair, the atheist is for this proposed law. He is not intelligently going to support a law which enables these people to burn him at the stake. Mr. Jones, I know he is not intelligently going to do it. Senator Blair, he is liable to be as intelligent as they are. Mr. Hume was a very intelligent man. So was Voltaire. So was Franklin. If Franklin was an atheist, Franklin was a deist at all events. Mr. Jones, it is safe to say that not one in ten of the people whose names are signed in behalf of this Sunday law 
know what is the intention of it and what those will do with it when they get it. Sandra Blair, this is a lack of intelligence on their part. Mr. Jones, I know people who signed that petition who would now be just as far from signing it as I would. Sandra Blair, that is because you told them of these terrible consequences which they had not believed would follow. The masses of the people do not believe that the Christian people of this country have united in every state in this union for such a purpose. Mr. Jones, here is the principle. Here are six million Protestants and seven million two hundred thousand Catholics. Senator Blair, Cardinal Gibbons has written a letter which is in evidence. He is for it, and a great many Catholics are also for it. But it does not follow that those Catholics are for it simply because Cardinal Gibbons wrote that letter. They were for it because Cardinal Gibbons wrote the letter. You must remember that the Catholics in this country are intelligent as well as we. Some of them are ignorant. Some of us are ignorant. Mr. Jones, but here is the point. These people are complaining of the Continental Sunday. Senator Blair, they do not complain of it because it is Catholic. They complain of it because it is not as good for the people as our form of Sunday. Mr. Jones, certainly... And in this movement, the American Sunday, they say, comes from the Puritans, and these peoples know. Sandor Blair, do you argue against it because it comes from the Puritans or because it comes from the Catholics? It comes from both, you say. We say it is for the good of society and that God is for it because it is for the good of men. Mr. Jones, but let me state the point that I am making. I think everybody knows that it is perfectly consistent with the Catholic keeping of Sunday for the Catholic to go to church in the morning color. and to the pleasure resort if he chooses in the afternoon. These men stand here in convention and cry out against the Continental Sunday and against its introduction here. Everybody knows that the Continental Sunday is the Roman Catholic Sunday. Yet these men, while denouncing the Continental Sunday, joins hands with the Roman Catholics to secure this Sunday law. They have counted here six million Protestants and seven million two hundred thousand Catholics. Suppose this law were secured in answer to these petitions, would they have then have a Puritan Sabbath or a Continental Sunday? In other words, would the six million Protestants compel the seven million two hundred thousand Catholics to keep Sunday in the Puritan or even the Protestant way, or will the seven million two hundred thousand Catholics do as they please on Sunday and let the six million Protestants whistle for the breath of the Puritan, which Dr. Herrick Johnson invokes? More than this, if it should come to compulsion between these, would not the seven million two hundred thousand Catholics be able to make it unpleasant for the six million Protestants? Senator Blair, I have been all through this that the working people go through. I have been hungry when a boy. The first thing I can remember about it is being hungry. I know how the working people feel. I have tugged along through the week and been tired out Saturday night, and I have been where I would have been compelled to work to the next Monday morning if there had been no law against it. I would not have had any chance to get the 24 hours of rest if the Sunday law had not been given it to me. It was a civil law under which I got it. The masses of the working people in this country would never get the 24 hours rest if there had not been a law of the land that gave it to us. There is that practical fact, and we are fighting with that, that state of things. The tired and hungry men, women, and children all over this country want a chance to lie down and rest for 24 hours out of the whole seven days. Mr. Jones, so have I been through this that the working people go through. I have carried the hod by the day. I have swung the hammer and shoved the plane by the day. I am a working man now just as much as I ever was, though not in precisely the same way, and I say to you that I never was robbed of that twenty-four hours rest, nor are there so many compelled to lose it as these Sunday law advocates try to make out. Dr. Kraft said last night over in that convention that he had 
had communication with people in every nation but two, and in the world around he could not find a man who had financially lost by refusing to work on Sunday, but many have gained by the conscientious sacrifice. Much testimony was borne in the Chicago Convention last month to the same effect in this country and in the convention now in session in this city. The Honorable Mr. Dingley, member of Congress from Maine, said last night that the American working men are indifferent to the efforts which are put forth in this direction. Senator Blair, he is wrong about it. Mr. Dingley didn't know what he was talking about when he said that. Mr. Jones, he said he had investigated the matter. Senator Blair, I have investigated it, and I say that Mr. Dingley was simply laboring under a misapprehension. Mr. Jones, Dr. Kraft said this morning that he talked two hours with a convention of laboring men at Indianapolis answering their questions until at the end of two hours they endorsed this movement. If they are crying for it, if they are fairly tearing their hair for it, how can it be possible that he had to talk two hours to persuade them that it was all right? Senator Blair, take this statement in full if you take it all. He says they are crying for it. Mr. Jones, then why was it necessary to talk to them for two hours? Senator Blair, then you simply say he did not tell the truth? You discredit the witness? Mr. Jones, I do. Senator Blair, you say perhaps he did not tell the truth, that is all. I think he was right. Mr. Jones, but the two things do not hitch together properly. If they are calling for it so loudly, certainly it ought not to require two hours to convert them. The fact is that the laboring men are not calling for it. Great effort is being made to have it appear so, but the knights of labor never took any such step except at the solicitation of Dr. Crafts. This bill had scarcely been introduced as last spring before Dr. Crafts made a trip to Chicago and other cities soliciting the endorsement of the Knights of Labor. Instead of their petitioning for the Sunday Law, they have first been petitioned to petition for it. The object of it had to be explained and objections answered before they could even be brought to support it. The object of the petition for this bill was explained by Dr. Crafts to the Central Labor Union of New York and its endorsement secured. The Central Labor Union embraces a number of labor organizations, and the Christian Union declares the Central Labor Union to be a radically socialistic organization. This in itself would not be particularly significant were it not for the fact that the arguments which Dr. Crafts presents to these organizations to gain their support are entirely socialistic, nor are these confined to Dr. Crafts. Other leaders of the movement also advocate the same principles. Dr. Crafts went to the General Assembly of the Knights of Labor at Indianapolis last month to get the delegates there to endorse the petition for the passage of the Sunday Bill. He has referred to this in his speech here this forenoon, and has made a portion of his speech to them and to the locomotive engineers a part of his speech here. A report of his speech at Indianapolis was printed in the Journal of United Labor, the official journal of the Knights of Labor of America, Thursday, November 29, 1888. He said to them there, Having carefully read and reread your Declaration of Principles and your Constitution, and having watched with interest the brave yet conservative shots of your powderly at intemperance and other great evils, I have found myself so closely in accord with you that I have almost decided to become a knight of labor myself. If I do not, it will be only because I believe I can advance your principles better as an outside ally. The following question was asked by one of the knights. Would it not be the best way to stop Sunday trains to have the government own and control the railroads altogether as the knight's advocate? Dr. Crafts answered, I believe in that. Perhaps the best way to begin the discussion of government control for seven days per week is to discuss this bill for government control as one day. If the railroads refuse the little we now ask, the people will be 
the more ready to take control altogether. The Knights of Labor advocate the doctrine that the government shall take control of all the railroads in the country and hire the idle men in the country at regular railroad wages and run the roads as is now runs the post office department without reference to the question whether anything is made or lost by the government. This is what gave rise to the above question. Dr. Crafts proposes to play into their hands by making the bid for their support that if they will help the Sunday law workers get government control of their railroads one day in the week, then the Sunday law workers will help the Knights to get government control every day in the week. Another question that was discussed both here and at the Convention of Locomotive Engineers at Richmond, Virginia was the following. Will not one day's less work per week mean one-seventh less wages? The response to this was as follows. As much railroad work as is done in seven days can be done in six days and done better because of the better condition of the men and on this ground the engineers would be sustained in demanding and if necessary compelling the railroad company to so readjust the pay schedule that the men will be paid as much as at present. That is to say, Dr. Crafts and the Sunday law workers propose to stand in with the labor men to compel employers to pay seven days' wages for six days' work. This is made certain by the following petition to the state legislatures, which is being circulated everywhere with the petition for this bill. I got this at the Chicago Convention. Dr. Crafts distributed the petitions by the quantity there, and he is doing the same at the convention now in this city. To the State Senate or House, the undersigned earnestly petition your honorable body to pass a bill forbidding anyone to hire another or to be hired for more than six days in any week except in domestic service and the care of the sick in order that those whom law or custom permits to work on Sunday may be protected in their right to some other weekly rest day and in their right to a week's wages for six days' work. Now a week consists of seven days. A week's wages for six days' work is seven days' wages for six days' work. This petition asks the legislatures of all the states to pass a law protecting employees in their right to seven days' wages for six days' work. No man in this world has any right to seven days' wages for six days' work. If he has a right to seven days' wages for six days' work, then he has an equal right to six days' wages for five days' work, and to five days' wages for four days' work, and to four days' wages for three days' work, to three days' wages for two days' work, to two days' wages for one day's work, and to one day's wages for no work at all. This is precisely what the proposition amounts to, for in proposing to pay seven days' wages for six days' work, it does propose to pay one day's wages for no work. But if a man is entitled to one day's wages for doing nothing, why stop with one day? Why not go on and pay him full wages every day for doing nothing? It may be thought that I misinterpret the meaning of the petition, that as it asks that nobody be allowed to hire another for more than six days of any week, it may mean only that six days are to compose a week, and that it is a week's wages of six days only that is to be paid for six days' work. That is not the meaning of the petition. It is not the intention of those who are gaining the support of the Knights of Labor by inventing and circulating the petition. Dr. Elliot, pastor of the Foundry Methodist Church in this city, the church in which this National Sunday Convention is being held, the church that is now festooned with 14 million petitions that they haven't got, festooned at least partly with one 7 million 200 thousand times multiplied cardinal, Dr. Elliot, while speaking in favor of this bill is fo this forenoon, was asked by Senator Call these questions. Do you propose that Congress shall make provision to pay the people in the employ of the government who are exempted on Sunday for Sunday work? Mr. Elliot, I expect you to give them adequate compensation. Senator Call, do you propose that the same amount shall be paid for six days' work as for seven? Mr. Elliot, I do. 
for the reason that we believe these employees can do all the work that is to be done in six days, and if they do all the work, they ought to have all that pay. There it is in plain, unmistakable words that they deliberately propose to have laws, state and national, which shall compel employers to pay seven days' wages for six days' work. This is sheer socialism. It is the very essence of socialism. No wonder they gained the unanimous endorsement of the Convention of the Knights of Labor and of the Locomotive Engineers and the Socialistic Labor Union of New York City by proposing to pay them good wages for doing nothing. I confess that I, too, would support the bill upon such a proposition as that if I looked no further than the money that is in it. But this is not all. The Knights of Labor not only accept the proposition, but they carry it farther and logically too. This principle has been advocated for some time by the Knights of Labor in demanding 10 hours pay for 8 hours work, virtually 2 hours pay for doing nothing. The Christian Union and the Catholic Review proposed to help the working men secure their demanded eight-hour law and then have the working men help to get six-day law by forbidding all work on Sunday. Dr. Crafts and Dr. Elliot go a step further and propose to secure the support of the working men by having laws enacted compelling employers to pay them full wages on Sunday for doing nothing. But the Knights of Labor do not propose to stop with this. The same copy of the Journal of United Labor, which contained the speech of Dr. Crafts, contained the following in an editorial upon this point. Why should not such a law be enacted? All the work now performed each week could easily be accomplished in five days of eight hours each if employment were given to the host of willing idle men who are now walking the streets. It is a crime to force one portion of a community to kill themselves by over overwork, while another portion of the same people are suffering from privation and hunger with no opportunity to labor. The speech of the Reverend Mr. Crafts, published elsewhere, furnishes an abundance of argument as to why such a law should be put in force. So when the Sunday law advocates propose to pay a week's wages for six days' work of eight hours each, because all the work can be done in six days that is now done in seven, then the Knights of Labor propose to have a week's wages for five days' work because by employing all the idle men, all the work that is now done in seven days can be done in five. And as Dr. Elliot has said, if they do all the work, they ought to have all the pay. But if a week's wages are to be paid for five days' work for, of eight hours each, that is to say, if two days' wages can rightly be paid for no work at all, why should the thing be stopped there? If the government is to take control of the railroads all the time in order to pay two days' wages for doing nothing, and if the states are to enact laws compelling employers to pay employees two days' wages for doing nothing, then why shall not the government, both state and national, take possession of everything and pay the laboring men full wages all the time for doing nothing? For if men have the right to one day's wages for no work, where is the limit to the exercise of that right? The fact of the matter is that there is no limit. If a man is entitled to wages for doing nothing part of the time, he is entitled to wages for doing nothing all the time. And the principle upon which Dr. Crafts and his other Sunday law confers, confers said, sorry, and the principle upon which Dr. Crafts and his other Sunday law confer gain the support of the working man to his Sunday bill is nothing at all but the principle of downright socialism. There is a point right here that is worthy of the serious consideration of the working man. These Sunday law workers profess great sympathy for the laboring men in their struggle with the grinding monopolies, and by Sunday laws they propose to deliver the working men from the power of these monopolies. But in the place of all these other monopolies, they propose to establish a monopoly of religion, and to have the government secure them in the perpetual enjoyment of it. They may talk as much as they please about the grasping, grinding greed of the many kinds of monopolies, and there is truth in it. 
but of all monopolies, the most greedy, the most grinding, the most oppressive, the most conscienceless the world ever saw or ever can see is a religious monopoly. When these managers of religious legislation have delivered the working men from the other monopolies, granting what they can do it, granting that they can do it, then the important question is, who will deliver the working men from the religious monopoly? Senator Blair, abolish the law of rest, take it away from the working people, and leave corporations and saloon keepers and everybody at perfect liberty to destroy the 24 hours of rest, and lawgivers and lawmakers will find out whether or not the people want it and whether they want those lawmakers. Mr. Jones, there are plenty of ways to help the working man without establishing a religious monopoly and enforcing religious observance upon all. There is another point that comes in right here. Those who are asking for the law and those who work for it are those who compel the people to work on Sunday. In the Illinois State Sunday Convention in Chicago last month, it was stated in the first speech made in the convention, We remember how that the working men are compelled to desecrate the Sabbath by the great corporations. The very next sentence was, We remember also that the stockholders, the owners of these railroads, are members of the churches, that they sit in the pews and bow their heads in the house of God on the Sabbath day. Senator Blair, that is only saying that there are hypocrites in this world. What has that to do with this proposed law? Mr. Jones, I am coming to that. It was a good deal to do with it. The stockholders who own the railroads act in this way, those men said, and it was stated by a minister in that convention that a railroad president told him that there were more petitions for Sunday trains from preachers than from any other class. Senator Blair, there are a lot of hypocrites among the preachers then. Mr. Jones, precisely, although you yourself have said it, I confess I have not the heart to dispute it. Senator Blair, I do not, uh, if it is, sorry, Senator Blair, I do not find any fault with that statement. If it is true, it does not touch this question. Mr. Jones, if these pre preachers and church members will not keep the Sabbath in obedience to what they say is the commandment of God, will they keep it in obedience to the command of the state? Senator Blair, certainly the hard-working man needs rest. The preachers, church members, and millionaires may do as they please. The bill comes in here and says that the national government, taking part of the jurisdiction of the civil government of the United States by a concession made by the states, by virtue of its control of interstate commerce and the post office business and the army and navy, will take advantage of what the states have given to the general government in the way of jurisdiction and will not introduce practices which destroy the Sabbath in the states. That is the object of this legislation. That is all that is undertaken here. It is simply an act proposing to make efficient the Sunday rest laws of the state and nothing else. Mr. Jones, but those laws are to be enforced, if at all, by those who are so strongly in favor of them. Senator Blair, no. By the state, if these people were in favor of them or not in favor of them or violated them, that is another thing. A man may be for a, may be for a law which he violates. A great many of the strongest temperance people in the world use intoxicating liquors. They say that they realize the evil and that they are in favor of the enactment of law which will extirpate those evils. The strongest advocates I have ever seen of temperance legislation are men who have come to realize that the grave is just ahead of them. They cannot get rid of the appetite, but they pray the government for legislation that will save the boys. Mr. Jones, that is all right. I am in favor of prohibition straight, but not Sunday prohibition. Senator Blair, you cannot adduce a man's practice as a reply to the argument on a question that touches the public good. It does not vitiate a man's principle because he fails to live up to it himself. Mr. Jones, but the secret of the whole matter is this. As an argument for the Sunday law, these men assert that the great railroad corporations desecrate the Sabbath and by persistently running Sunday trains also compel the railroad men to work and to desecrate the day. 
they at the same time assert that the men who own the railroads belong to the churches. If then the railroads compel their men to desecrate the day, and the owners of the railroads are church members, then who is it but the church members that are compelling people to desecrate the day? Further than this, they quoted at Chicago the statement of a railroad president that the roads get more requests for Sunday trains signed by the preachers than they do from other people. But as the church members own the railroads and the preachers request them to run Sunday trains, then who is to blame for the desecration of the day but the preachers and their own church members? Can't the preachers stop asking for Sunday trains without being compelled to do so by the civil law? In the Chicago Convention last month, November 20 and 21st, Dr. Knowles, who is secretary of this National Sunday Law Union, said that by the influence of William E. Dodge, even after his death, the Delaware and Lackawanna Railroad Company had resisted the temptation to run trains on Sunday until the present year. But 500 ministers met in the conference in New York and used competing lines on Sunday, and by this, the hands of the Sunday Observance Committee have been tied ever since. After that, when the Delaware and Lackawanna directors were asked not to run Sunday trains, they replied, How can you come to us pleading for us to run no trains on Sunday when your preachers by the hundreds on Sunday use our rival lines which do run on Sunday? If your preachers ride on Sunday, trains on other roads, we cannot see why they and other people cannot ride on our trains on Sunday. And if it is all right for these other roads to run trains on Sunday, and certainly ministers of the gospel would not ride on them if it were wrong, then we cannot see how it can be such a great wrong for us to run Sunday trains. That is a very proper answer. No wonder the Sunday committee's hands are tied by it. And yet the very conference of 500 preachers assembled in New York last summer took the first decided step toward the organization of the National Sunday Association of which Dr. Knowles himself is secretary. By these facts, there is presented the following condition of things. 1. Church members on the railroads. 2. Preachers sign requests for Sunday trains. 3. The church members grant the request of the preachers for Sunday trains, and the preachers ride on the Sunday trains, and other church members go on Sunday excursions. 4. When the whole company, preachers and church members, together petition Congress and the state legislatures to make a law stopping all Sunday trains, that is to say they want the legislatures, state and national, to compel their own railroad-owning church members not to grant the request of the preachers for Sunday trains. In other words, they want the civil power to compel them all, preachers and church members, to act as they all say that Christian ought to act. And they insist upon quoting all the time the commandment of God, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But if they will not obey the commandment of God, which they themselves acknowledge and quote, what assurance have we that they will obey the law of Congress or state legislature when they get it, especially as it will rest entirely with themselves to see that the law is enforced? Will they compel themselves by civil law to do what they themselves will not otherwise do? The sum of this whole matter is that they want the civil power to enforce church discipline, and that not only upon themselves, but upon everybody else. The whole system and all the pretensions upon which this Sunday law is demanded are crooked. As to the enforcement of the law, it will fall to, to those who are working to get it, because certainly those who do, who do not want it will not enforce it, and the officers of the law are not given to the enforcement of laws which are not supported by public opinion. This is proved by the fact that the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago now have Sunday laws that ought to satisfy any reasonable person, and yet not one of them is enforced. And the preachers of that city and state, instead of seeing that these are enforced, call convention after convention to work up more Sunday laws, both state and national. What then is the next intention? It is to make it a political question in both state and nation, and make the enactment and enforcement of Sunday laws the price of votes and political support. This is, this is proved 
by the following resolutions adopted by the Elgin Sunday Law Convention. Resolved that we look with shame and sorrow on the non-observance of the Sabbath by many Christian people and that the custom prevails with them of purchasing Sabbath newspapers, engaging in and patronizing Sabbath business, business and travel, and in many instances giving themselves to pleasure and self-indulgence, setting aside by neglect and indifference the great duties and privileges which God's day brings them. Resolved that we give our votes and support to those candidates or political officers who will pledge themselves to vote for the enactment and enforcing of statutes in favor of the civil Sabbath. Such a resolution as this last may work in Illinois, though it is doubtful, but their own statement made in that convention, it is certain that this resolution can never work under the Constitution of the United States. They stated in the convention that the Sabbath is the test of all religion, to demand that candidates or political officers shall pledge themselves to vote for the enactment and enforcement of statutes in favor of the Sabbath is, therefore, to require a, a religious test as a qualification for office. The National Constitution declares that no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under this government. Consequently, no Sabbath or Sunday law test can ever be applied to any candidate for any national office or public trust. It is true they use the word civil in the resolution, but that corresponds with much of their other work. There is not and there cannot be any such thing as a civil Sabbath. The Sabbath is religious holy and they know it. And in all their discussion of this resolution and the subject generally in the convention, it was a religious institution and that only. Senator Blair.